Okay. This instruction is to go over the OASIS C1 accuracy and assessment and documentation. The agenda for this instruction, uh, we will go over Chapter 3 of the OASIS C1 manual, um, review the CMS item utility, co the conventions, comprehensive assessment, OASIS M items, assessment sections of the OASIS, interventions and goals, um, orders and disciplines, skilled nurse intervention that we need to make sure we're included in the plan of care, supervision, and the OASIS check PPS analysis, and then also support. So the first thing, Chapter 3, the OASIS C1 manual, it is an item by item guidance for all of your OASIS questions. Um, the item intent uh, just basically gives you the definition of um, behind the question itself. The time points um, gives you exactly the OASIS that that particular question um, shows up on. Your response specific instructions are the instructions for that particular question. And then your data sources and resources just gives you information on where you can find further information on that particular question. Here is just a um, snapshot of what the actual item question looks like as you go through Chapter 3 in your OASIS C1 manual. And you can go to the CMS website in order to download that. And I do suggest that everyone go and download um, or even just save it as a favorite um, um, on your laptop. On your OASIS item utility, um, that's PPS, your OBQI, OBQM, Home Health Compare, and the Process Measures. And we're going to go through each of those. On your PPS case mix, that is your HHRG score. And the HHRG score is basically how an agency is paid um, through Medicare. So the score that is obtained from your assessment um, calculates the amount of money that the agency receives for that 60-day certification period for that patient. You'll see on this screen the item number in the chart, the description. Um, basically, the M question itself it shows you which one um, of the questions that actually go towards your HHRG score. So, for instance, your MOVE 110, your M1020, 1022, and 1024 which are your diagnosis area that contributes to your HHRG score, M1030, M1200, 1242-1308. So you'll just see in that chart each one of the questions that contributes to the HHRG score. Your OBQI, that is the risk adjustment outcome measures. Um, the data is collected for CMS and it levels the playing field for the um, for agencies. So for instance, if you have a patient that you um, needs a higher level of care, but another patient that doesn't need as high of a level, but the HHRG scores are the same, um, according to the data collecting that CMS is collecting, you can level the playing field and have a higher reimbursement and then not count against you um, when you have those patients that um, have a higher level of care that is needed. Your OBQM, those are the 12 potentially avoidable events. For instance, a fall with the injury um, or wound infection. So your potentially avoidable events are basically events that we want to make sure that we do avoid in home health. Your home health compare, that's our public report card. Um, and for years they've been talking about actually paying home health agencies according to your outcomes. And um, so we keep a close eye on this already, so we will be prepared for it. But it looks like there may be a possibility in 2016. But we will continue um, to do our end to where we're already ready for it when it does come. So that public report card basically um, compares your uh, start of care, resumption of care, and your discharge 
um, to each other. So that's why we review every single discharge and try to ensure that we have actually discharged patients with goals met and the patients have actually had improvement while on service with us. On your process measures, um, it promotes good outcomes, making sure we're using best practices and process measures domain. Um, that's your timely care, which is your move 102, 104 on your OASIS, your care coordination, which is your M2250, patient assessment, care planning, care plan implementation, education, and prevention. So CMS collects this information um, and um, whenever we go through and we actually review um, our report card or just our agency information, um, you want to make we want to make sure that all of these things we're doing on time and that the patients are actually getting better and receiving education from us while they're on services with us. The conventions. The conventions are basically rules um, that um, have been put in place for the OASIS. We're going to go over the general OASIS item conventions, and then we'll also go over the ADL and IADL item conventions. So on the general OASIS conventions, the first one, understand the time period under consideration for each item. Report what is true on the day of the assessment unless a different time period has been indicated in the item or related guidance. Day of assessment is defined as 24 hours immediately preceding the home visit and the time being spent by the clinician in the home. Number two, for OASIS purposes, a care episode, also referred to as a quality episode, must have a beginning, and that's either start of care or resumption of care assessment, and a conclusion, which is either a transfer or a discharge assessment, to be considered a complete care episode. Three, if the patient's ability or status varies on the day of assessment, report the patient's usual, usual status or what is true greater than 50% of the assessment time. So basically, when you have um, OASIS questions and they have multiple tasks in that particular question, you want to look at what is greater more than 50% of the time for that patient on those particular tasks that are listed in that question. You want to minimize the use of NA and unknown on your responses. Five, responses to items documenting a patient's current status should be based on independent observation of the patient's condition and ability at the time of the assessment without referring back to prior assessments. Several process items require documentation of prior care at the time of or since the time of the most recent start of care, resumption of care, or follow-up OASIS assessment. These instructions are included in the item guidance for the rele relevant OASIS questions. Six, combine observation, interview, and other relevant strategies to complete OASIS data items as needed. For example, it is acceptable to review the hospital discharge summary to identify inpatient procedures and diagnosis at start of care or to examine the care notes to determine if a physician-ordered intervention was implemented at transfer or discharge. However, when assessing physiologic or functional health status, direct observation is the preferred strategy. 7. When an OASIS item refers to assistance, this means assistance from another person unless otherwise specified within the item. Assistance is not limited to physical contact and it also includes verbal cues and supervision. 8. Complete OASIS items accurately and comprehensively and adhere to the skip patterns. 9. Understand the definitions of words as used in the OASIS. 10. Follow rules included in the item specific guidance or chapter 3 of this manual. 11. Stay current with evolving CMS OASIS guidance updates. CMS may post updates up to twice per year in June and December. 12. Only one clinician may take responsibility for accurately completing a comprehensive assessment. However, for selected items, collaboration is appropriate. These exceptions are noted in the item-specific guidance. 
13, when the OASIS item includes language specifying one calendar day, this means until the end of the next calendar day. And 14, the use of that is means scoring of the item should be limited to only the circumstances listed. The use of for example means the clinician may consider other relevant circumstances or attributes when scoring the item. So those are the general OASIS conventions. You want to make sure that you understand each one of those and make sure as you go through and answer your OASIS questions that you are remembering the guidelines and you can always again review uh, go to the CMS website and like I said make sure that you do bookmark or add that website as a favorite so you can go back to it pretty quick um, as a resource So your ADL and IADL conventions um, go over how to make sure you're answering those functional questions um, correctly, and that's the um, M1800 um, questions on your OASIS. So number one, report the patient's ability, not actual performance or willingness, to perform a task. While the presence or absence of a caregiver may impact actual performance of activities, it does not impact the patient's ability to perform a task. So whenever you're going through and you're um, answering your questions, for example, with um, bathing, you don't answer the question according to the patient's performance or their willingness if you have a patient who lives alone and they are currently bathing themselves you don't automatically mark that patient as independent with bathing. You want to look at what's that patient's ability to bathe independently. And then we'll go on to the next question, excuse me, the next convention, number two, to where you want to make sure to look at what the patient's ability to safely complete that activity. So number two, the level of ability refers to the patient's ability to safely complete specific task or activities. Three, understand what tasks are included and excluded in each item and select the OASIS response based only on included task. If the patient's ability varies between the different tasks included in a multitask item, report what is true in the majority of the included tasks giving more weight to tasks that are more frequently performed. And five, consider medical restrictions when determining ability. For example, if the physician has ordered activities restrictions, consider this when selecting the best response to functional items related to ambulation, transferring, etc. So if the physician has put the patient on bed rest and that patient should not be getting up, ambulating or should not be getting up and um, taking showers, then you need to document according to what the physician um, has actually ordered that the patient be on bed rest. But then you make sure that you are documenting that the patient is actually getting up, ambulating, and getting up to the shower against medical advice. Okay, let's go into the comprehensive assessment. You have the initial assessment visit, the components of the comprehensive assessment, the completion of the comprehensive assessment, and then patient population. We're going to go over each one of these items. On your initial assessment visit, all patients require a comprehensive assessment. It determines immediate and support needs, determines the elig eligibility and homebound status. That initial assessment must be conducted within 48 hours of the referral or within 48 hours of their return home from an inpatient facility or on a physician ordered start of care date. So if nursing is ordered at the start of care, an RN must perform the start of care oasis. If therapy has only been ordered, then a PT or an ST can perform a start of care. An occupational therapist cannot perform um, a start of care for Medicare patients. Um, components of the comprehensive assessment, you have your OASIS assessment items, your comprehensive assessment items, your discipline specific assessment items, and then they're combined in a clinically 
meaningful arrangement and we'll go over those as we go through the oasis completion of the comprehensive assessment it must be completed in a timely manner it must be completed by one clinician the clerical staff may enter demographic and agency ID items so you know patients address phone number Medicare number um, physician those types of things can be entered on the clerical side and the office clinician may assist um, with the discharge oasis if that is needed but your discharges should be completed by a um, by the last clinician that was in the patient's home the last qualifying clinician that was in the patient's home so that could be um, a nurse or an RN has to be an RN that could be PT that could be OT or that could be ST because OTs can perform a discharge oasis the patient population for the comprehensive assessment um, patients have to be 18 and older the OASIS data required for skilled Medicare and skilled Medicaid patients and it must contain OASIS data also required for payers that mandate use of OASIS for reimbursement so your OASIS M items we're going to go through each section and the OASIS is um, separated into different categories that we'll go through you have your patient tracking your clinical record items your patient history and diagnosis living arrangements sensory status integumentary status respiratory status cardiac status elimination status neuro emotional and behavioral status your ADLs and IADL section medications care management therapy need and plan of care emergent care and discharge so let's get started on your clinical record items your M or your MOVE 100 your reason for assessment you have your start of care your resumption of care your recertification other follow-up transfer to inpatient facility not discharged from the agency transfer to inpatient facility being discharged from the agency death at home and discharge from agency so we'll go over each one of these um, in a little bit more detail on your resumption of care it is following an inpatient stay of 24 hours or longer you do not need it if observation only no matter how long the patient was in observation so if a patient is in the hospital and they're under observation only even if they're there for three days we do not have to do a transfer and a resumption of care because they were not an actual inpatient admission to that hospital um, if a patient goes in and they are admitted and it's for only diagnostic tests uh, transfer and a resumption of care is not needed a resumption of care does require a home visit it must be completed within two days of the patient's return home or knowledge of the patient's return home because sometimes we do have those patients that um, go into the hospital and we don't know that they did and when the LVN for example goes out for that one time a week visit they find out then that the patient was in the hospital for two days so then we need to make sure that we get out there as soon as possible and get that resumption of care done within two days from the knowledge of us knowing that the patient was in the hospital and um, we want to make sure also with the resumption of care that we complete it if a patient returns home from an inpatient facility within that last 56 um, to 60 days of the CERT period because then that resumption of care is going to serve two purposes it's going to um, be a resumption of care in that current CERT period and we will need to create a post hospital order and that will also serve as the recertification oasis going into that new CERT period so you would create a 485 from it for your new CERT period on your recertification um, you perform during the last five days of the CERT period it does require a home visit if an agency misses the research window CMS says do not discharge and readmit 
And I want to point out and make sure that we do not make this a habit. Um, even though CMS does say go ahead and perform that recertification as soon as you can, if you miss that five day window at the end, you cannot make it a habit of doing this. But um, you want to make the visit and complete the recertification assessment as soon as the oversight is identified. Um, and we will receive a warning message when we submit that OASIS. Explain the circumstances in, in your clinical documentation and um, the cert period dates remain the same. Transfer to an inpatient facility not discharged from the agency. Complete if you believe the patient will return to our services once discharged from an inpatient facility. Um, patient has been transferred and admitted to an inpatient facility. The stay is 24 hours or longer for reasons other than diagnostic testing. It does not require a home visit. It must be completed within two days of the transfer date or knowledge of the transfer date. On your MU906, the date patient admitted to the inpatient facility, not the emergency room. So if the patient went into the emergency room on March the 3rd, but they were not actually admitted to the hospital until March the 4th, the date for your hospital admission would be 3-4. If patient doesn't return to the agency, um, you do not have to do an OASIS discharge. You just would do a DC summary. Transfer to an inpatient facility discharged. Complete if the patient will not return to services. Also complete if the patient dies in the emergency room, outpatient surgery, um, or outpatient recovery room, or while under outpatient observation status. And the same as the transfer without discharge from services. The death at home complete when the patient dies somewhere other than an inpatient facility or the emergency room. If a patient dies at home, if they die at church, if they die in an ambulance, or if they're pronounced dead on arrival in the ER. So if um, EMTs are working on the patient on the way to the emergency room and that patient dies in the ambulance, that patient is um, considered to have died at home. Um, because they did not actually get to the emergency room and pass away in the emergency room itself. So just be aware of that. And it must be completed within two days of um, the, the death of the patient. And on your MOVE 906, that is the actual date that the patient passed away. On your discharge from the agency, um, you complete a discharge from agency OASIS when um, the discharge is not due to an inpatient facility admission and is not due to death, a visit is required. If an unplanned discharge or a patient declines discharge, the following requirements must be met. Assessment must report the patient status as will be and be conducted by a qualified clinician based on an actual visit in the patient's home. So it has to be completed by an assessing clinician and not by an office clinician. So when we discussed earlier an office clinician could help with the discharge, those are on those questions when you have to go back and look at um, if the patient um, is a CHF patient, have they, did they have exacerbations of their CHF during that time and what was the intervention if they did. Um, if you needed assistance with that, um, you could be helped, but it actually has to be completed and filled out by that last qualified clinician that was in the home and actually based on the knowledge and, and, um, and an actual visit. Continuing on your clinical record items, on your MOVE 102, the date the physician ordered the start of care, you only enter a date here if the start of care or the resumption of care um, was specified by the physician. So if the physician did not give a specific date, then this should be NA, and then it takes you over to your MOVE 104, which is the date of your referral. And you want to report the most recent date that a verbal, written, or electronic authorization 
um, came um, for the agency to um, or was received by the agency. If the start of care is delayed, the date can be updated or revised and just make sure that there's a paper trail showing why that your, your start of care was not done within 48 hours. So if we have a patient, especially these um, ortho patients that are going in for surgery, um, if we have a patient, we receive those prior to the surgery, the patient has the surgery and they think that the patient is going to get out and um, go home in a couple of days but then there's a complication the patient stays for a whole week and then they um, either call the agency or they fax us more information then we can update our referral date on that date that they resend more information or call us back again to let us know that the patient will be coming out um, I just want to point out on your save and save and continue you want to make sure that when you're documenting that you're clicking on um, that tab at the end of each one of your categories so you're not losing any of your information so don't um, go through do check marks and then go back up to the toolbar at the top and um, click out onto something else because you may lose some of your data so you want to make sure you always scroll to the very bottom and click save or save and continue Continuing on with your clinical record items, on your MOO 110, your episode timing, your early episode, that is a patient who um, is within their first and second episode with a home health agency. Your later is any, is your third episode and more. Medicare PPS episode is an adjacent episode and no more than 60 days delayed in the services and that includes home health services by any agency so if a patient was discharged from Susie Joe home health agency um, 30 days ago and now they're back in the hospital they're coming out and they were with that agency for five episodes they're coming out of the hospital and we get a new referral and we go out to admit that patient the episode timing on that patient would be later and not early because they had five episodes with a previous home health agency and there has not been more than a 60 day um, um, time where that patient has not had home health services so that continues those episodes continue even though they're with a different agency so just want to make sure that you are aware of that okay now we're going into our patient history and diagnosis on your M1010 this is um, your inpatient diagnosis and you want to make sure um, that you are putting them at the level of high specificity for only those conditions treated during the inpatient stay within the past 14 days and you cannot use E codes or V codes on M1010. So um, if coding guidelines instruct that diagnosis be coded as an active etiology and manifestation pairing, then list both even if the etiology was not actually treated. So if you have a patient that um, has diabetic neuropathy um, even though maybe the um, neuropathy itself wasn't treated but let's say um, the diabetes was um, patient may have had some changes in their insulin during that uh, inpatient stay because their blood sugars were out of whack <clears throat> during that time even though the neuropathy itself was not necessarily um, treated during that stay you do have to list the neuropathy in the um, M1010 because you still have to continue to follow your coding guidelines and so you would have to list the manifestation for that di those diabetes on your item M1016 this um, goes over the diagnosis requiring medical or treatment regimen change within the past 14 days Report when the change is due to new onset, exacerbation of an existing condition, or change made due to a lack of improvement or worsening of the condition. Also, again, if um, coding guidelines instruct you that diagnosis can be coded as an active etiology and manifestation pairing, you do have to list um, 
the etiology and the manifestation together according to, to the guidelines, even if it wasn't actively treated. Okay, so now we're going into your um, diagnosis section, which is your M1020, M1022, and M1024. So there's three steps to accurately choosing your diagnosis. The first is um, completing your comprehensive assessment. The second is developing a plan of care. And the third is you want to paint the patient's diagnostic picture vertically in M1020 and 1022. So we should be able to look at those diagnoses and see um, what is going on with that patient. Now let's go over your primary and your secondary diagnosis. Um, your diagnosis should be current. Anything that has been resolved is not appropriate to report in 1020 and 1022. So even if um, in 1016 for your inpatient diagnosis, you listed pneumonia because that is the pa why the patient was in the hospital. When that patient is discharged home and that pneumonia has been resolved, they're no longer on antibiotics, there's no respiratory problems, then you would no longer list that pneumonia um, in 1020 and 1022 because now they're home from that acute setting and they no longer have that diagnosis. Same thing with the UTI. If they had that UTI in the hospital, they don't have it anymore, then you would not list it in M1020 or M1022. Now you can list the V code for a history of a UTI, which is V1302, but you would not use 599.0 um, for the UTI in your diagnosis coding. So your primary diagnosis is what goes in M1020. This is a condition that is the chief reason for your home care and it may or may not be related to the most recent hospital stay. So for example, if you have a patient that was in the hospital originally for an exacerbation of their COPD but they're home now and the main reason for the home health services in the home is to teach the patient on their diabetic management. They've had a new diagnosis of diabetes and they're needing to learn how to use their glucometer, how to administer, um, draw up and then administer their insulin and that's the focus of home health. Then you want to make sure that the diabetes is your primary diagnosis because that's your main focus for your home health and then your COPD would just be listed in um, your secondary diagnosis. So your secondary diagnosis um, start with your 10-22, those conditions that um, also need attention. They impact the patient's recovery and you list an order that best reflects the seriousness of the condition and to justify the disciplines and services that are being provided by the home health agency and not necessarily um, putting them in order of symptom control. Your Medicare PPS case mix, those are diagnosis codes that contribute to the clinical um, category of your HHRG score. So um, you have certain diagnoses that will give you points towards your HHRG score and then the number of points depends on what episode you're in, if you're in an early episode or if you're in a later episode. Okay, for example, with your um, diagnosis such as hypertension, your basic hypertension 401.9 gives you absolutely no points towards your clinical category of your HHRG score for a reimbursement, but a code like 403.90, which is your hypertension with chronic kidney disease, does give you points towards your HHRG score. So um, the reimbursement is very important in home health, but we have to make sure that we are using diagnoses that are relevant to home health um, care and diagnosis that we have received from the physician. So if you ever have questions on whether or not a patient has a diagnosis, you want to make sure that you are contacting the physician's office so we can be accurate. On your diagnosis control, um, basically you're rating the degree of symptom control for the condition that you've listed. Um, in column one, you want to make sure that you use the following. Zero is asymptomatic, um, the patient is receiving no treatment at the time. One means the symptoms are well controlled with the current therapy that the patient is receiving. 
Two, are symptoms controlled with difficulty that are affecting the daily functioning and or patient needs ongoing monitoring. Three, um, are symptoms poorly controlled and patient needs frequent adjustment in treatment and dose monitoring. And four, those are symptoms that are poorly controlled and the patient has a history of rehospitalizations. So on each one of your diagnoses um, that you're listing in your 1020 and your 1022, you want to make sure that you are um, rating with your symptom control. But on your V codes, you do not use symptom control on V codes. So let's now go over to therapies. On your M1030, these are therapies that the patient receives at home. So this is only related to those things that the patient is receiving at home. And it is regardless of who's managing it. So if a patient is going to their physician and they're receiving um, maybe some type of treatment, um, let's say chemo for their um, cancer, then you would not include that on here because they're not actually receiving those treatments at home. But if the patient is receiving IV or infusion therapy at home and the caregiver is the one actually performing it, you would still mark, number one, that the patient is receiving IV or infusion therapy. So on your IV and infusion therapy, you would check it if the patient um, or another person is flushing and or infusion infusion is occurring at home and that includes intermittent flushes do not mark if the IV cath is present but not active so even if the patient is not actually receiving any type of treatment through um, that particular um, um, IV or infusion device but it is being flushed then you would make sure that you would be checking number one on your parental nutrition, that includes TPN or lipids. Your enteral nutrition includes um, nutrition by nasogastric, gastrostomy, and other artificial entries. Do not mark if only flush to maintain patency, use to hydrate with water, or use for medications only. So on your enteral nutrition, it's a little bit different than your IV. So if the patient is not actually receiving nutrition, through their G-tube and it's only being used for hydration and medications, then you would not check number three for your enteral nutrition. Okay, on your M1033, your risk for hospitalization, it just basically identifies the patient's characteristics that may indicate the patient is at risk for hospitalizations, and this is just solely based on your clinical judgment. So as you go through and you assess the patient, and then you go through and you review um, these answers, it's all based on your clinical judgment. On your M1041, um, on your influenza vaccine data collection period, does this episode of care, start of care, resumption of care to a transfer or discharge, include any dates on or between October 1st and March 31st? This is collected um, at, dis at time of discharge. So if a patient's episode falls within March the 1st, excuse me, October 1st to March 31st, then you would automatically mark this yes. And then you go down to M1046, and it asks you the reason if the patient did or did not receive the flu vaccine for this year's flu season, and you just document um, for that patient. On your N M1051, this is um, on your pneumonia vaccine, and basically has the patient ever received the vaccine, yes or no. And then on your M1056 is the reason um, it was not received. So um, explains why the patient has never received it. And then I just wanted to make sure I do give you um, what the medical contraindications are um, for a patient to not receive the pneumonia vaccine. They have an anaphylactic hypersensitivity to, compo to components of the vaccine. Um, they have an acute febrile illness bone marrow transplant within the past 12 months, chemo or radiation within the past two weeks, or physician medical restriction. So um, on your 
Number two, when it says assessed and determined to have medical contraindications, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of what those contraindications are. On your M1100, your patient living situation, which of the following best describes the patient's residential circumstance and availability of assistance? And you mark only one box. So the patient's living situation and the availability of caregivers to provide assistance. So this is two questions in one. So if the patient has recently changed living arrangements, report their usual living arrangement unless new living arrangement is going to be permanent. So for example, if you have a patient that was in the hospital, the daughter brought the patient home with her, and the patient is only going to stay there for a week until she has a little bit more recovery and able to go home, then this question should reflect that patient living in her own home and not at that daughter's home because that's just a temporary arrangement. So the two questions in one, you're answering what the patient's living arrangement is. And then the second question is, what's the availability of assistance? So when you look at the living arrangement, you're looking in um, the column of A, B, or C. Does the patient live alone? Does the patient live with other persons in the home? Or does the patient live in a congregate situation? So are they at an assistant living facility or some type of residential care home? So you will determine A, B, or C. And then once you determine that, then you're going to go across that row to answer your next question about your availability of assistance. So your regular daytime and nighttime, I want to go over just a little bit more detail on those. During the daytime and nighttime hours includes hours every day and night with infrequent exceptions. And then your regular daytime, nighttime is not confined by CMS. So it's just basically your clinical judgment. On your occasional short-term assistance, that's only for a few hours a day or on an irregular basis. So you want to be really careful because a lot of times I'll see patient lives alone and then um, the availability of assistance is checked around the clock. So if that patient lives alone um, but somebody is there 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, does that patient really live alone? So just make sure that you notice that this is two questions in one. Your first column answers your first question and then you use your rows to go down and answer the second question. Okay, now let's move on to the sensory status. We're starting with M1242, which is the frequency of the pain interfering with the patient's ability or movement. Does the patient avoid certain activities to avoid pain? Has the patient changed the way some things are done? Does the patient take longer to perform certain activities? Does it result in the activity being performed less often? And then, does the activity require the patient to have additional help? So when we're speaking of um, pain that's interfering with that patient's day-to-day -day activities, you want to look at those, those different things. Um, does the patient avoid doing something that they may need to do in their personal care because it's too painful for them to do it? Do they avoid um, getting up, um, you know, to the restroom and you have a patient that just always uses a urinal because it hurts too much to get up from his recliner and go to the bathroom? Those are the things you look at. Is it interfering with their day-to-day -day, um, living activities? Now let's start with our skin section. So on your integumentary status, we're going to start with M1300. This is your pressure ulcer assessment. Was this patient assessed for risk of developing pressure ulcers? This should always be checked yes, because on your OASIS um, on Kinzer, we will, uh, should always be using the braiding scale on every patient. So this should always be answered number two. On your M1302, does this patient have a risk of developing a pressure ulcer? You want to make sure that you're using the guidelines that are listed on that um, braiding scale to determine if that patient is at risk or not. And then you just answer yes or no.
Let's talk about pressure ulcers. On your pressure ulcers, a stage one and a stage two pressure ulcer can heal. This is according, everything that we'll be going over is according to WOCN guidelines. So one thing that I will suggest is that you go to the WOCN website and when you click on there, um, they do have a section that is specific to answering OASIS items for home health. Click on that um, and then save that as a favorite or bookmark it on your tablet or your laptop so you will always be able to have easy access to it as a resource because you will um, use it quite frequently as you go through your OASIS. So on your stage one and two, they can heal. On your stage threes and fours, they close. Stage three and stage four pressure ulcers do not ever heal. And you want to make sure that there's no reverse staging. So if you have a stage four pressure ulcer, that pressure ulcer will always remain a stage four. Um, it will never go down to a three. And with your three, it can um, decline and go to a four, but a three can never be reversed and go back to a two or a one. So um, you want to make sure that on your stage threes and your stage fours that you realize they do not heal, they only close. And we'll go over that in a little bit more detail as we go through and answer some of these OASIS questions. Um, to review debridement, it does not change the classification of a wound. So if you have a physician that debrides a pressure ulcer, it remains a pressure ulcer. If a trauma wound or a burn are debrided, they remain a trauma wound or a burn. They do not convert over to a surgical wound. The only time that a pressure ulcer can change to a surgical wound is if a muscle flap or a skin advancement flap or rotational flap um, um, was performed or the pressure ulcer um, is no longer there because the patient had an amputation performed or it was actually surgically excised, not debrided, but surgically excised would turn a, change a pressure ulcer over to a surgical wound. On um, your M1306, does this patient have at least one unhealed ulcer at a stage two or higher or designated as unstageable? This excludes your stage one pressure ulcers and your healed stage two pressure ulcers. So this is a yes or no question. <clears throat> it um, focuses on stage two pressure ulcers or higher or unstageable. And you answer yes if you have a stage two pressure ulcer that is unhealed or you have a stage three pressure ulcer that is even either opened or closed or you have a stage four pressure ulcer that is open or closed or the pressure ulcer is unstable. Excuse me, unstaged. On your M1307, the oldest stage two pressure ulcer that is present at discharge. So this question is only answered or um, on discharge and it refers to an unhealed stage two pressure ulcer only. And then you're answering if it was present at the most recent start of care resumption of care or it was developed since the most recent start of care or resumption of care and you need to put in the date that it was first identified or in a that the patient does not have any stage two pressure ulcers present at discharge. On your M1308, that is your current number of unhealed pressure ulcers at each stage or unstageable. That includes current stage two, open or closed stage three, stage four, and the unstageable. If the patient does not have these particular um, pressure ulcers, then you want to make sure that you are entering a zero and not leaving that blank. On your M1309, this is worsening in pressure ulcer status since the start of care or resumption of care. This is only collected at discharge. <clears throat> now let's go through um, the specific details on your M1309. On your response specific instructions from your chapter three of your OASIS manual, 
Um, you want to make sure that you review the history of each current pressure ulcer. Compare the current stage of the pressure ulcer to the stage that the ulcer was at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. Determine the pressure ulcer currently present is new or worsened when compared to the presence or stage of that pressure ulcer at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. Mark a response for each row of this item, A, B, and C. If there are no ulcers at a given stage, you want to enter a zero in that row. Report the number of current pressure ulcers at each stage that are new or have worsened since the most recent start of care. So let me point that out again. This is related to those pressure ulcers um, that have worsened since the last resumption of care or start of care. So let's go over each row in detail. So for your row A, that is in reference to your stage 2, you want to enter the number of current pressure ulcers at discharge whose deepest anatomical stage is a stage 2 that were not present or were a stage 1 at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. So you enter a 0 if there are no current stage 2 pressure ulcers or no stage 2 pressure ulcers that have worsened since the recent start of care or resumption of care. So even if the patient has a stage 2 pressure ulcer and that stage 2 pressure ulcer has not worsened since the start of care or the resumption of care, you are going to enter a zero. Remember, this is not asking you, does the patient have this particular stage pressure ulcer at discharge? It's asking if it has worsened since the start of care or resumption of care. So for your row B is related to your stage 3 and you enter the number of current pressure ulcers that were at discharge whose deepest anatomical stage is stage 3 that were not present <clears throat> or were a stage 1 or 2 at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. You want to enter a 0 here if there are no current stage 3 pressure ulcers or no stage 3 pressure ulcers that have worsened since the most recent start of care or resumption of care. <clears throat> and again, if the patient has a stage 3 pressure ulcer, but that is the same stage 3 pressure ulcer that was on um, documented on the start of care or resumption of care, you would enter a zero here um, because it has not worsened since the st start of care or resumption of care. On your row C, that's your stage 4, you want to enter the number of current pressure ulcers at discharge whose deepest anatomical stage is stage 4 that were not present or were stage 1, 2, or 3 at the most recent start of care or resumption of care. And you want to enter a 0 if there's no current stage 4 pressure ulcers or no stage 4 pressure ulcers that have worsened since the start of care or resumption of care. On your row D, that's your unstageable due to coverage of a wound bed by slough or eschar. Pressure ulcers that are unstageable due to slough or eschar are those in which the wound bed is not visible due to some degree of necrotic tissue or scabbing that the clinician believes may be obscuring the visualization of bone, muscle, tendon, or a joint capsule. But make note of this. If a stage 4 structure is visible, the pressure ulcer is not considered unstageable. It is a stage 4 even if there is slough or eschar present. So <clears throat> if you are able to visualize bone, even though the, stage, the wound itself has slough or eschar, you would not consider it unstageable if you are able to visualize a stage 4 structure such as bone or tendon. On your row D, we're going to continue on that. For your pressure ulcers that are currently unstageable due to slough or eschar, worsening refers to a pressure ulcer that was either not present or was a stage 1 or 2 pressure ulcer at the most recent start of care resumption of care is now unstageable due to slough or eschar. Pressure ulcers that are currently unstageable due to presence of slough or eschar 
and were stage three or four at the most recent starter care are not considered worsened. You want to enter a zero if currently there are no pressure ulcers that are unstageable. All current unstageable pressure ulcers three to fours or were unstageable the most recent starter care or resumption of care. Pressure ulcers that can be reported as new or worsened are uh, pressure ulcers that are unstageable for any reason at most starter care or resumption of care. Pressure ulcers that are covered with non removable dressing or device discharge. And a suspected tissue injury and pollution present at the starter care or resumption of care at discharge. This next little um, chart is actually in um, your chapter three of your OASIS manual. And it just gives you a real quick glance to help you with answering 1309. So if you start with, yes, the patient does have a stage two, um, and then you kind of go across and it helps you as to whether or not you need to answer yes or no. Same thing with your three, your four, your unstageable. Because it can be a little bit confusing um, with the way that they've set the questions up. So this is just a real quick guidance to kind of help you. Again, um, when you pull this up, I would bookmark it or mark it as a favorite on your tablet or your, lap or your laptop device in order to be able to reference back to it quickly um, when you have questions as you're answering your, your um, discharge oasis. Okay, now on your M1320, that is the status of the most problematic pressure ulcer that is observable. So um, there's three steps to this. First, you want to determine which pressure ulcers are actually observable. Then you want to determine which observable pressure ulcer is most problematic. And then you want to determine and report that the healing status of that pressure ulcer. And we're going to go through real quick um, the definitions of your um, answers that they have listed. And I actually pulled this from the WOCN guidelines. Again, like I said, if you will go to the WOCN website and make sure that you do tag the OASIS guidance on your um, device so you can have it back, have it listed as a quick reference. But these are your definitions. For your newly epithelialized, those are wound beds that are completely covered with new epithelium no exudate, no avascular tissue, which is your slough or your eschar, and no signs and symptoms of infection. I do want to give a real quick example on your newly epithelialized. When you are marking that this patient um, has a stage 3 or a stage 4 and they are closed, because remember, if a patient has a stage 3 or a stage 4 pressure ulcer, they will always have that stage 3 or stage 4 because they do not heal, they only close. So the way that you would answer your 1320 would be newly epithelialized because it is completely closed and that's not a wound that we are um, having to perform any wound care on. So when you list those, you want to make sure when you get to 1320 that you do check zero for newly epithelialized. You're fully granulating. Your wound bed is filled with granulation tissue to the level of the surrounding skin. There's no dead space, no avascular tissue, no signs and symptoms of infection, and your wound edges are open. On your early partial granulation, that is greater than or equal to 25% of the wound bed is covered with granulation tissue. Less than 25% of the wound bed is covered with avascular tissue. No signs and symptoms of infection, and the wound edges are open. Your uh, pressure ulcers that are not healing, your wound with uh, greater than or equal to 25% of avascular tissue or signs and symptoms of infection or clean but non-granulating wound bed or closed hyperkeratotic wound edges or persistent failure to improve despite appropriate comprehensive wound management. On your M1322, that is just the current number of stage 1 pressure ulcers. Um, it only refers to stage 1 pressure ulcers, so if the patient has none, then you would mark zero. 
on your M1324 that is the stage of the most problematic unhealed pressure ulcer that is stageable so um, that is um, exclusive pressure ulcers that have a wound bed covered with eschar non-removable dressing or suspected deep tissue injury so out of, if that patient has more than one pressure ulcer so for example if they have a stage two and a stage three then you want to document which one of those is the most problematic um, and just because the patient has a two and a three doesn't automatically make the three the worst if the two is the one that has the signs and symptoms of infection and the patient is on an antibiotic related to that stage two pressure ulcer and the three is healing um, then your most problematic is going to be your stage two on your M1330 does this patient have a stasis ulcer you're looking at the current number of stasis, stasis ulcers you're looking at if they are observable or unobservable and this is related to venous insufficiency these are not related um, to arterial lesions or ulcers so these are just your um, um, venous insufficiency stasis ulcers and then you want to list the status of the most problem problematic stat okay start over on that one on your M1334 you are listing the status of the most problematic stasis ulcer that is observable so um, again you're fully granulating your um, early partial and your non healing and we'll go over those definitions now definitions for your stasis ulcers you're fully granulating um, your wound bed is filled with granulation tissue to the level of the surrounding skin there's no dead space no avascular tissue no signs and symptoms of infection and your wound edges are open your early partial granulation is greater than or equal to 25 percent of the wound bed is covered with granulation tissue less than 25 percent of the wound bed is covered with avascular tissue no signs and symptoms of infection and your wound edges are open on your non-healing stasis ulcers your wound um, those are your wounds with greater than or equal to 25 percent of avascular tissue or signs and symptoms of infection or you have a clean but non granulating wound bed or closed hyperkeratotic wound edges or persistent failure to improve despite the appropriate comprehensive wound management on your M1340 does this patient have a surgical wound um, your zero is no one is yes the patient has at least one observable surgical wound and two is that the patient has a surgical wound but it's um, not observable due to a non removable dressing or device um, you don't consider surgical wounds if the surgery was performed to a mucous membrane the eyes such as cataract surgery or gynecological surgery by vaginal approach all ostomies are excluded wound um, when ostomy surgically reversed or taken down is a surgical wound but the ostomy itself is not considered to be a surgical wound just a real quick reference for your surgical wounds um, the next two slides are just screenshots of a quick reference um, on your M1340 surgical wounds this was something that was given to me um, that I can always make copies of um, and have them available in the office but it's a really good reference tool for um, you to be able to look back at at what are actually surgical wounds and what are not surgical wounds um, so your ostomies are definitely excluded anything with the opening that has an ostomy at the end is not considered to be a surgical wound unless it is reversed or it is taken down wounds with drains are considered surgical wounds even after the drain is removed even if the drain opening was created percutaneously and even if the drain is inserted to a puncture site however ostomies with a drain or needle puncture um, sites um, without a drain are not considered surgical wounds 
your central line sites, your implanted infusion devices, your implanted venous access devices are surgical wounds, even if they're not presently function. Um, and that includes the Vantos device, your AV shunts, grafts, and fistulas. However, a pick line, um, a VP shunt after the incision heals, implanted pacemakers or internal defibrillators or external infusion devices infusing med subcutaneous are not surgical wounds. Your pick lines are not surgical wounds, even if insertion required uh, fluoroscopy or suturing in place. However, centrally inserted central lines are considered surgical wounds, even if the catheter type inserted centrally was intended for peripheral insertion. Most surgical incisions are surgical wounds, including sites resulting from surgical procedure performed via arthroscopy, incision created to insert a mammal site balloon catheter, incision or cut down performed uh, procedure per femoral sheath, muscle flap, pressure ulcer damage totally excised surgically, skin graft donor site, shave, punch, excisional biopsy site, LVAD exit site, orthopedic pin sites, and peritoneal dialysis catheter exit site. However, the following are not surgical wounds. Intercutaneous fistulas, callus removal sites, the skin graft recipient site, and pressure ulcers closed with sutures. Your needle puncture sites are not surgical wounds. Debridement does not change a burn, pressure stasis also tra traumatic wound, etc. into a surgical wound. Simple IND is not a surgical wound unless the procedure goes beyond a simple IND. Trauma wounds are not surgical wounds unless beyond simple sutured traumatic laceration and removal or a simple excision of a toenail is not a surgical wound unless the procedure goes beyond simple excision. So you want to make sure um, that um, you do keep these in mind as you're going through answering um, your M1340 for your surgical wounds on how to answer that correctly. And again, if you um, need a copy of this, you can go to the CMS website or I will also make sure that this quick reference is located in the offices. On your M1342, this is the status of the most problematic surgical wound that is observable. Um, when closed by primary intention, which is your sutures, staples, or chemical bonding, it is a current surgical wound for approximately 30 days after re-epithelialization. Um, let's continue on your M1342. If a scab is adhering to underlying tissue, full epithelialization has not occurred in the scabbed area. So that means that the surgical wound is healing by secondary intention. Openings in the skin adjacent to incision line caused by removal of the staple or suture not considered part of a surgical wound when determining healing status. Implanted venous access devices and infusion devices. Once inserted, site is healed, status is newly epithelialized for as long as it is implanted. The status when a needle access um, always in place cannot fully granulate and remain non-healing while that line or that needle is in place. Your primary versus secondary intention. This is um, related to the healing of these surgical wounds. Your primary intention, that means no openings or disruption in the incision, can only have a status of non-healing or newly epithelialized. So when a, wound, when a surgical wound is healing by primary intention, it cannot be fully granulated or partial um, 
granulation. It can only be answered as newly epithelialized or non-healing. And these are guidelines from the WOCN website. If re-epithelialized without signs and symptoms of infection, that is newly epithelialized. And it is only newly epithelialized for approximately 30 days. If the scab is adhering to the incisional tissue and or there are signs and symptoms of infection, then that means it's non-healing. Your secondary intention um, are openings or disruption in the incision line. And they can have all, um, they could be either of these statuses. They could be non-healing, they could be early partial, they could be fully granulating, or they could be newly epithelialized. But that is only if they're healing by secondary intention. Okay, let's review the surgical wound definitions. Newly epithelialized, as the wound bed is completely covered with new epithelium, no exudate, no avascular tissue, and no signs and symptoms of infection. You're fully granulating. Your wound bed is filled with granulation tissue to the level of the surrounding skin. There's no dead space, no avascular tissue, and no signs and symptoms of infection, and the wound edges are open. On your early partial granulation, it's greater than or equal to 25% of the wound is covered with granulation tissue. Less than 25% of the wound bed is covered with avascular tissue, and there's no signs and symptoms of infection, and the wound edges are open. And then finally, you're not healing, or your wounds with greater than or equal to 25% of avascular tissue, signs and symptoms of infection, or clean but non-granulated wound bed, or closed or hyperkeratotic wound edges, or the persistent failure to improve despite appropriate comprehensive wound management. Are you ready? Okay, on M1350, does this patient have a skin lesion or an open wound? And that's excluding bowel ostomy other than those described above that is receiving intervention by the home health agency. This is only collected at start of care and resumption of care. It includes open wounds and skin lesions not addressed in the other OASIS C1 intake inventory items. <clears throat> it's included but not limited to burns, diabetic ulcers, cellulitis, abscesses, edema, trauma wounds, um, your PIC line and peripheral IV sites, and then your non bowel ostomies. Um, your tracheostomies, your urostomies, um, but it, you're addressing those skin lesions or open wounds that were not um, previously addressed in other OASIS C1 um, skin items. Okay, now we're going to go over the respiratory status, and we're just going to cover one OASIS item here, and that's your M1400. When is the patient dyspneic or noticeably short of breath? You want to make sure you assess and observe if the patient is noticeably short of breath. Get the patient up and moving, if at all possible. So you're looking at um, when the patient comes to the door to answer it, to let you in. Um, you want to get them moving by asking them um, you know, to go to the bathroom or to their bedroom or the kitchen or wherever they have their medications, for example, and have them gather all of their meds. Get them up and moving in some kind of way without you saying, okay, I just want you to get up and do some moving around. Ask them to do particular tasks while you're there and then you observe if they have shortness of breath. Because if you just ask a patient, do you have short of, are you ever short of breath? Do you have shortness of breath? Then nine times out of 10, they're just going to say no. And if you're just sitting down with the patient, um, they're just hanging out in their recliner your whole visit, then they're not going to have shortness of breath unless it's at rest while you're there. So you want to get them up and moving so you can actually observe um, them getting short of breath. If the patient uses oxygen continuously, you want to assess with the oxygen on. But if the patient has oxygen and it's only intermittently, then you want them to get up and move about without the oxygen on because you want to base it on um, um, when that patient does not have the oxygen on, which is probably more frequently than when they do have the oxygen on. And you want it to be based on the patient's use of the oxygen and not the physician's order. Sometimes we have patients that um, have 
oxygen ordered um, to use uh, PRN with shortness of breath and they never use it or um, it's supposed to be PRN but they keep it on all the time because they're just afraid of not having it on so if it is ordered by the physician to be intermittent then you want to base your answer to this question on how often the patient actually uses the oxygen and you want them to be off of it to perform activities and move around okay we have a couple of questions we're going to go over with the cardiac status on your m1500 um, symptoms in heart failure patients if patient has been diagnosed with heart failure, did the patient exhibit symptoms indicated by clinical heart failure guidelines using, um, excuse, including dyspnea, orth orthopnea, edema, or weight gain at the time of or any time since the previous OASIS assessment? This information is collected on transfer and discharge. So you select 0, 1, or 2 if the patient has heart failure diagnosis. Um, if no, um, the patient doesn't have diagnosis and did not exhibit symptoms. Not assessed, um, has the diagnosis, it was never assessed for symptoms of heart failure at any point. And then NA is, does not have the diagnosis of heart failure. On your M1510, your heart failure follow-up. If the patient has been diagnosed with heart failure and has exhibited symptoms indicative of heart failure at the time of or any time since the OASIS assessment, what action um, had been taken? And you mark all that apply. This includes any action taken at least one time in response to the heart failure symptoms identified at or since the last OASIS assessment. No action taken is uh, no action was taken at any time since the last OASIS assessment. And response one, communication to the physician on the same day of the symptoms and response received the same day. And remember in our convention instructions, it told us that that same day is basically a 24 hour period. So if um, um, we called today, um, let's say at noon, and we didn't hear back from the physician until tomorrow at five o'clock, then um, we would not be able to mark response number one because that did not happen within the same day. But if the physician called us tomorrow morning by 8 a.m., um, then we would be able to mark response number one. On your elimination status, there's just one question I wanna go over here and that's M1610. Your urinary incontinence or urinary catheter presence. You mark response zero when there is no incontinence or no cath or patient has an ostomy for urinary drainage. If the ostomy pouch, um, if the ostomy is pouched, select response zero. If the ostomy has a catheter, even intermittent, then you want to mark response number two. Response number one is any type of incontinence or related to urinary. Response two is your urinary cath for any reason. So if a patient is both incontinent and requires a cath, um, so a patient has stress incontinence and they have intermittent catheterization for retention, then you want to mark response number two. And response number two also includes a condom cath. Okay, so your neuro, emotional, and behavioral status. I just want to go over one question in this section. That's for M1730. And that is um, basically your depression screening. Um, it may not be appropriate for some Alzheimer's and dementia patients um, who are not able to respond to questions. So be really careful about that. But otherwise, we want to make sure that we are um, performing the PHQ2 questions um, on all patients. And so your instructions is a two-question tool. You ask the patient, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? And the first one is little interest or pleasure in doing things. If they tell you, not at all, I never have it, or maybe one day, zero. Um, but if they're having it more frequently and they say um, more than half of the days of the week 
then um, you want to mark number two in that column. Then the next question is, when are they feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And you just go across and you answer according to um, the answer that they've given you. Now, if a patient has a diagnosis of depression, then um, you can kind of see how if the antidepressant that they may be on um, is effective. If a patient has never had a diagnosis of depression and they're not on an antidepressant and they're answering these questions saying yes, that they do have these particular symptoms, you have to make sure that you are notifying the physician of this because this may be something that the physician is not aware of. So be really careful um, as patients answer these questions. You want to make sure that there is documentation in your OASIS that you've contacted the physician to notify the doctor of these symptoms that the patient is having. Okay. The next section that we'll be going over are the ADLs and IADLs. Um, you assess the patient's ability to safely perform their ADL and IADL tests. Let me say that again, the patient's ability to safely perform their ADL and IADL tests. Report the patient's ability and not their willingness or actual performance of the task. Determine the safety through skilled observation and assessment. Do not make assumptions. Evaluate the technique used, equipment used, and the risk for injury. Um, ability made temporarily or permanently limited by physical impairments, emotional or cognitive or behavioral impairments, sensory impairments, environmental barriers, and medical restrictions um, which would require an MD order. And what type of assistance does a patient um, receive? Do they just need verbal cues, reminders, standby assist, or hands-on assist? And when the ability varies between tasks, response should be related to the patient's ability for the majority of the tasks. And disregard the presence or absence of a caregiver when determining a patient's ability to complete the task. So um, a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, you want to make sure that even though the patient lives alone and they're having to uh, perform these tasks because they live alone does not necessarily mean um, the patient is independent um, with safely performing those particular tasks. They're just doing it because they have to. So again, you want to look at um, their ability to safely perform those ADLs. Um, and then you want to look at how they are performing them. For example, um, <clears throat> I had a patient on a starter care that um, I had to demonstrate to me how he um, was able to shower because um, he said he was independent with everything. So I went asked him, um, could I see him um, actually perform a couple of tasks? So we went to his bathroom and he showed me how he gets in and out of his tub to take a shower. And it was a very small bathroom. And he would place um, his left hand on the door handle um, of the door to the bathroom. He placed his right hand on the sink. And then he would just scoot his legs back until his bottom touched um, the shower chair. And then he would just kind of basically lean back, fall back onto that shower chair. And then pull one leg over at a time over into the tub. So even though he was performing... Um, the task of uh, you know transferring himself, ambulating, and actually getting into the sub, none of that was safe because that his hand could have slipped off that door handle at any time. Um, his hand could have slipped off the sink. Um, he could have fallen, hit his head, and he lives alone and nobody's there to help him. So um, you want to make sure that you are actually determining how these patients are performing these particular tasks. So let's get started. On your M1810, that is the current ability to dress the upper body safely with or without dressing aids, including undergarments, pullovers, front opening shirts and blouses, managing zippers, buttons, and snaps. So keep in mind that is how that patient performs all of those tasks. Um, and then on your M1820, the current ability to dress the lower body safely 
with or without dressing aids, including undergarments, slacks, socks or nylons, and shoes. And again, you're looking at all of those tasks. Now, something I do want to point out before we go further um, in the ADL, IADL section, the best way to answer these questions until you get to know the answers on the OASIS itself is to read from the bottom up because a lot of nurses um, as they start to read from the top going down they say oh yeah this patient that's them and they may mark a one but when you actually go and you read from the bottom um, you think oh wait a minute no that patient is more of a two so you just want to make sure that you're reading from the bottom up because you do want to actually um, um, have this patient pictured in their true state so patient depends entirely upon another person to dress the upper body someone must help the patient put on upper body clothing able to dress the upper body without assistance if the clothing is laid out or handed to the patient able to get clothes out of the closets and drawers put them on and remove them from the upper body without assistance so just make sure again that you're reading from the bottom up until you're actually getting to know the answers of the OASIS itself. So let's go over a few things for your M10 and um, your M1810 and 1820. Included are dressing tasks. Um, the patient has to obtain, put on, and remove the clothing items. So you have to look at all three of those things. Devices are a part of body apparel. So if the patient has a prosthesis, any type of um, orthotic, an AFO, a splint, a corset, a brace, a knee immobilizer, elastic bandages worn for support and compression, um, those are considered to be um, body apparel that you would consider in your in these particular tasks not included are wraps utilized solely to secure a wound dressing so if the patient is wearing elastic bands for support and compression you do include those but if it's just um, patient has a wound and it's wrapped to keep the dressing on then you don't consider that um, again you don't want to make assumptions interview the patient observe them um, and observe the type of clothing um, and abilities to access those clothing items. Each piece of clothing or a supported device or prosthetic um, are considered a dressing task. If ability varies between the tasks, pick the response that best describes the majority of the task. Use your clinical judgment. And if a patient requires standby assistance, or a lot of people will call a spotter to be safely or need verbal reminders, then that, that correct answer is response number two. Okay, so on your M1830 with your bathing, the current ability to wash the entire body safely, it excludes grooming because remember grooming um, um, was in M1800 which we did actually go over but that is in your M1800 address there so washing the face washing the hands and shampooing the hair is not a part of this bathing question but let's go over M1830 in detail you want to focus on the ability to assess the tub or shower transferring in and out of it and bathing the entire body once the needed items are within reach. So included in this are washing the entire body and transferring in and out of the tub or shower. Excluded are gathering supplies, preparing the bath water, shampooing hair, washing the face and hands, and drying off after the bath. Medical restrictions um, impacting the oasis. Order, do not get into tub, impacts ability to bathe in the tub, um, or an order that is to keep the cast dry may impact their ability. So if the patient has on a cast and um, their leg is in the cast and they're ordered to keep that cast dry, they may or may not be able to um, transfer in and out of the tub or even get in the tub at all in order to keep that cast dry. So those are things that you need to take into consideration. Now, if the patient can bathe in the tub or shower, um, you select zero um, if the patient needs no human assistance and no device. 
you select one if they need no human assistance but they need a device to assist them you select two if they need intermittent human assistance which requires one two or all three of the types of assistance for intermittent supervision or encouragement or reminders to get in and out of the tub or shower or washing difficult to reach areas and you select number three if they need continuous human assistance throughout the bath so for um, if a patient can bathe in the tub or shower you would select zero one two or three if the patient cannot bathe in the tub or shower then you need to look at the following um, for example there is no tub or shower in the patient's home or it's non-functioning it's unsafe or medically restricted from getting in and out of the tub or shower or there's some type of environmental barrier so um, four and five are your sink bathers so you select four if the patient is independent with or without devices at the sink in a chair or a commode must be able to access the water at the sink or set up a basin at the bedside and they need no human assistance and you select number five if that patient requires intermittent or continuous assistance or supervision of another person throughout the bath must be unable <clears throat> must be unable to bathe in a tub or shower but able to participate in bathing self and needs human assistance and six you would select if the patient is unable to effectively participate in the bathing it doesn't matter what type of bath so whether or not the patient is able to get in the tub or shower or um, it's a bed bath or it's um, a bath and chair sitting on a commode um, if the patient needs um, assistance throughout the entire bath they are not able to help at all then your answer is number six on your M1840 your toilet transferring you're looking at the current ability to get to and from the toilet or bedside commode safely and transfer on and off the toilet or commode included in this task is the ability to get to and from the toilet with or without a device the ability to use the bedside commode with or without help transfer on and off the toilet commode and bedpan excluded are um, personal hygiene clothing management when toileting and emptying the bedpan so let's go over the questions on how to answer M1840 correctly you select zero if the patient can get to and from the toilet independently during the day but uses a bedside commode at night for convenience select number one if the patient requires assistance reminders cues to get to and from the toilet patient requires assistance to get to and from the toilet or assistance with transferring or both select number two if the patient is unable to get to and from the toilet but is able to independently use a bedside commode with or without a device select number three if the patient is unable to get to and from the toilet or bedside commode but able to place and remove a bedpan or a urinal independently whether or not they can empty it and select four if the patient can place and remove a urinal but needs assistance with a bedpan or if the patient is totally dependent in toileting on your M1845 your toileting hygiene that is the patient's current ability to maintain perineal hygiene safely adjust their clothes and or incontinence pads before and after using the toilet commode bedside pan or urinal if managing ostomy this includes cleaning around the area stoma but not managing the equipment so the focus is on the ability to access needed supplies implements and manage hygiene and clothing once at the location where the toileting occurs so let's go over the details on 1845 
It includes pulling clothes down and up, managing incontinence pads before and after using the toilet, adequately cleaning or wiping the perineal area, urinary catheter care, if applicable. Have to be able to do all of these things. And if managing an ostomy, it includes cleaning the area around all urinary and bowel stomas. Excluded from this question are managing the ostomy equipment, transferring and getting to and from the toilet or bedside commode. What this question focuses on is not the patient getting to um, the uh, toilet or the bedside commode um, or whatever type of device to use um, for elimination. This is once the patient gets there. How do they manage their toileting hygiene? The majority of the test rules doesn't apply here. If a patient can't pull down their pants, they can't be a zero or a one. In response number two, um, they can participate in the hygiene and or clothing management, but need some assistance with either or both activities. On your M1850 transferring, that is the patient's current ability to move safely from bed to chair or ability to turn and position self in bed if the patient is bed fast. So sleeping and sitting surfaces may vary. Some patients don't sleep in the bed. Um, there's no chair in the bedroom. So um, you have to look at where is that patient sleeping. Includes moving from a supine position on current sleeping surface to a sitting position on the side, then some type of standing, stand pivot, sitting pivot, or sliding board transfer to sitting surface, and then back to the supine position on the sleeping surface. So need for assistance to ambulate to chair in another room may impact the score. So let's go over um, the details on how to answer your M1850 appropriately. So your response number one is if the patient can transfer safely with minimal hu human assistance or with the assistance of a, um, or the use of an assistive device. Your response number two, unsafe with just minimal human assistance or unsafe transferring while just using the device or they require both. And your minimal human assistance can include any combination of verbal cueing, environmental setup, and or actual hands-on assistance. Minimal means individual assisting is contributing less than 25% of total effort required to perform the task. Bedfast is defined as one day uh, on the day of assessment, patient is either medically restricted to the bed or unable to tolerate being out of bed. It's not required out of bed for any specific length of time and use clinical judgment to determine if the patient can tolerate being out of bed. Unable to tolerate being out of bed examples, bed fast. They have multiple symptom atrophy. Um, they become severely hypotensive within one minute of moving from a supine to a sitting position or not bed fast and they're just deconditioned after hospitalization and only able to sit up in a chair for a few minutes. On your M1860, on your ambulation and locomotion, this is the current ability to walk safely once in a standing position or use a wheelchair once in a seated position on a variety of surfaces. So it includes the ability to safely walk once in a standing position or use a wheelchair once in a seated position on a very variety of surfaces. Patient may need a team of people to get up, but once they're up, how safe are they is what you need to be looking at when you think about this question. Excluded is the transfer itself. So um, in your previous questions, you've had um, to look at or assess um, the patient's transfer. This is just looking at once that patient is up um, in a standing position or once they are seated in their wheelchair, what are their abilities? So let's go over 1860 in detail. 
um, the variety of surfaces um, is just basically typical surfaces routinely encountered in the patient's environment and they may vary um, based on that individual's residence so you have some patients homes who um, when you step into the kitchen um, there may be a step down or a step up um, to actually get into the kitchen area or the same thing with the bathroom you need to look at um, are there any obstacles in the way um, of their ambulation or um, um, locomotion to move around in their own home and then do they have stairs do they have um, bedrooms that are upstairs that they have to get to um, so do they have to go up and down stairs so you just need to look at the variety of the different surfaces that the patient um, will encounter in their home so your response zero is no assistive device and no human assistance is needed response number one is a one-handed device and no human assistance needed response number two is a two-handed device and or intermittent human assistance is needed the patient is safe without device on level surfaces but require human assistance to negotiate stairs steps or uneven surfaces because again remember you're having to look at if that patient is able to walk on even and even surfaces and negotiate stairs with or without railings on your um, response number three continuous human assistance or supervision at all times that um, and they don't have to have a walking device in order for you to be able to answer number three um, they're just basically unsafe walking alone um, if there is a need for devices, whether one-handed or two-handed, varies between different surfaces, report the device that makes the patient safe on all surfaces. So if a patient is able to um, ambulate um, throughout their living room because it's a wide um, open space, they're able to use just their cane one-handed, um, but once they go further into the home maybe um, into the kitchen or having to go to use the bathroom and they need a two-handed device then you would need to report the two-handed device okay on your m1900 this is the prior functioning adl iadl um, it just basically reports what the patient's abilities were um, before his present illness exacerbation or injury um, and you only check one box in each row so a b c and d um, but let's go over what your independent needs some help and dependent are independent means no human assistance is needed at all needs some help um, is needing some human assistance and dependent is that that patient is completely dependent on someone else for that particular task they're incapable of performing that task or activity okay on your M1910 um, has the patient had a multi-factor fall risk assessment using a standardized validated assessment tool this should always be yes so you're going to either answer number one that um, it does not indicate a risk for falls or number two it does indicate a risk for falls on the oasis that we use on cancer um, they all have the MAC-10 so we should be making sure that we are performing that MAC-10 uh, fall risk assessment on every patient and then answer um, if they're at risk for falls or not at risk for falls according to the MAC-10 guidelines okay now we're moving on to medications um, we have a couple of questions we'll go over here um, on your M2000 that is your drug regimen review um, does the a complete drug measure regimen review indicate potential clinically significant medication issues um, for example adverse drug reactions ineffective drug therapy significant side effects drug interactions duplicate therapy omissions dosage errors or non-compliant or non-adherence um, this is collected at start of care and resumption of care only 
We want to make sure that we are performing a complete drug regimen review on all patients um, and we are including all medications prescribed and over the counter by any route. Now, um, what I do want to point out here is in cancer, once you have um, completed your medication profile, you want to make sure that you are um, completing the medication reconciliation on every oasis. Basically, cancer will go through, it will compare all of the medications that that patient is on that we've put into the system, and it will let you know if there's any contraindications um, between the meds, any food, food, drug, drug, I mean, excuse me, food, drug, or drug to drug um, um, problems that show potential for problems. And then you go through and you sign that with your electronic signature. If it does give you any type of um, report of potential um, interactions or um, um, complications, then please make sure that we are sending that information to the physician. On your M2002 or your 2002 medication follow-up, was a physician or the physician designee contacted within one calendar day to resolve clinically significant medication issues, including reconciliation? This is collected at start of care and resumption of care only. If a problem was found, of course, we need to make sure that we do notify the physician the same day. And you answer yes, only if the physician is contacted and reconciliation um, is in one calendar day, which is by the end of the next calendar day. So you want to make sure that um, you only check this if we have some reconciliation um, uh, um, contact back to us from the physician. So if you contacted the physician today, he does not, and it's um, Thursday, and that physician does not contact us back with any type of new order or to even acknowledge um, that they have received the report that we've sent um, on Monday, then you have to answer no to this question because just notifying the physician does not qualify you to be able to answer yes. On M2004, which is your medication intervention, if there were any clinically significant medication issues at the time of or at any time since the previous OASIS, was a physician or the physician designee contacted, contacted within one calendar day to resolve any identified clinically significant medication issues, including reconciliation? This answer or this question is collected at transfer and discharge only. And you can only say yes if the physician responds to the agency communication with acknowledgement of receipt of the information and or further advice or instructions. And you have to make sure that you are documenting the contact with the physician. M2010, the patient or caregiver, high-risk drug education. Has the patient or caregiver received instruction on special precautions for all high-risk medications, such as hypoglycemics or anticoagulants, and how and when to report problems that may occur? This question is only collected at start of care and resumption of care, and you answer yes if high-risk medications are prescribed and education was provided. On your M2015 patient caregiver drug education intervention, at the time of or at any time since the previous OASIS assessment, was the patient or caregiver instructed by agency staff or other healthcare provider to monitor the effectiveness of drug therapy, adverse drug reactions, and significant side effects, and how and when to report problems that may occur? Um, it's either yes, no, or patient not taking any drugs. Um, and this is collected at transfer and discharge only. And M2020, the management of oral medications, this is collected at start of care, resumption of care, and discharge. And it's the patient's current ability to prepare and take all oral medications reliably and safely, 
including administration of the correct dosage at the appropriate times or intervals. And this excludes injectable and IV meds. And this refers to the ability and not the compliance or the willingness to take their oral medications. So again, this is only focused on oral medications and it includes all prescribed and over-the-counter medications. Um, just a couple of things. If you look at um, number three, unable to take medication unless by, administered by another person. So if the caregiver actually has to administer the medications um, to the patient, then you would choose number three. But, for instance, if we go in and we set up a medication planner or if a caregiver sets up the medication planner um, in order to assist the patient in remembering to take their meds, then you would look at number one. On M2030, this is the management of injectable medications. It's the patient's current ability to prepare and take all prescribed injectable medications reliably and safely, including administration of correct dosage at the appropriate times or intervals. This excludes IV medications. Now, these are injections that the patient is receiving at home. If the patient goes to the physician, um, and receives any type of injection at the physician's office that is not included in this question. This is only what the patient is receiving at home, and it doesn't matter who's giving it at home, whether the patient themselves, a caregiver, or the agency. It includes obtaining from where the med is stored, drawing up the correct doses using aseptic technique, injecting into the appropriate site and disposing of the syringe properly. So you all four of those things have to be looked at um, when reviewing this question. On your M2040, the prior medication management, indicate the patient's usual ability with managing oral or injectable medications prior to this particular illness, exacerbation, or injury. So um, it identifies the patient's prior medication management. And when you talk about ability, independent means that the patient needs no assistance, um, needs some help, is minimal, or um, excuse me, or some type of human assistance. And dependent is incapable of performing that task or activity. And then, of course, NA if you're not taking any oral meds or NA if you're not taking any injectable medications. Okay, let's talk about care management. We're only going to go over one question on this one, and that's M2102. Um, you want to make sure that you're checking only one box in each row. So you have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And um, you're just marking um, according to um, the answers across the top. Um, no assistance needed um, or non-agency caregiver is currently providing the assistance. So each one of those rows should have an answer for it um, across the chart. Um, Non-agency caregivers, um, Meals on Wheels, I want to point out here, and other assistance counts as a caregiver. So um, if that patient lives alone and um, they receive Meals on Wheels, then the people at Meals on Wheels are considered a caregiver. And when it comes to administering that patient's medications, you're going to check that the caregiver um, is not likely to um, assist with medications or they're not likely to assist with um, the home exercise program because they're coming in and delivering those meals, but they are considered to be a caregiver. Therapy need and plan of care on your M2200. In the home health plan of care for Medicare payment episode for which this assessment will define a case mixed group, what is the indicated need for therapy visits? And then you put in your number and you want to make sure you have three digits. So if no therapy is going in the home, you're going to put 000. 
um, since we do have to go ahead and give an estimated number of therapy visits that we believe will be performed in that CERT period, if we have one therapy discipline going into the home, for example, PT, um, and no OT or ST, then we will use the number 12. So you will put 012. And if you have more than one therapy discipline going in, if you have PT and let's say ST, then you're going to use the number 14. So you would enter 014 here. Um, therapy includes PT, OT, and ST, not social worker. Um, and the number of therapy visits does determine the case mix group. Um, you must enter three digits, and like we had already talked about, if no therapy, then you're going to put 000. Um, to go over um, your M2250, um, one thing I do want to point out is anything that you check yes in this chart for your 2250, you have to make sure that there is an intervention included as a part of your uh, plan of care. Because the question is, um, does the physician ordered plan of care include the following? I see A, row A, answered incorrect, incorrectly quite a bit. Um, I do see where a lot of OASIS I've reviewed say yes. But if we are just using our standard agency vital sign parameters, then this is NA. Um, NA is just basically um, what we use and we haven't received per specified parameters from the physician. Row B is related to your diabetic foot care. If a patient has a diagnosis of diabetes, this should always be yes because we should be assessing that patient's um, lower extremities every single time we go into that, to that home. On your fall prevention interventions, um, when you performed the MAC-10 fall risk assessment and that patient is at risk for falls, this should be answered yes because we need to include fall risk preventions um, interventions in our plan of care. And then your depression interventions, this should be yes if the patient has a diagnosis of depression or we've gone through and performed that PHQ-2 and they're showing signs of depression that we need to make sure we report to the physician. Um, interventions to monitor and mitigate pain, that's the majority of our patients we should um, be monitoring pain. Interventions to prevent pressure ulcer. On your Braden scale, if that patient scored um, high and they are, excuse me, if that patient scored low and they are at high risk for um, pressure ulcers, you want to make sure to check yes here. And then if the patient has a pressure ulcer and it's being treated uh, with moist wound healing, um, then we want to make sure that we are checking that yes. So let's go over that a little bit more detail down below. Um, in the next slide, um, again, you answer yes for your vital signs only if the physician orders specific parameters, otherwise NA. Um, your diabetic foot care, if you, in your um, OASIS, if you choose the diabetic um, clause or the template that we have previously already entered into cancer, then you will be covered with making sure that this is a part of your plan of care. Same thing with your your fall prevention, your depression. You want to make sure if you go in and choose those particular um, drop-down tasks as a template, then um, you're covered with making sure that this is a part of your plan of care. Pain, we want to always make sure that we're assessing pain on every patient. Your pressure also prevention, same thing. There's a drop down um, in your task for the template um, that you would want to include. And then your moist wound healing for pressure ulcer, um, you have alginate, colloids, gels, negative pressure treatment, evidence your requested uh, moist wound healing treatment from the physician. On emergent care, um, on your M2300 and M2310, um, this is a long list of particular diagnoses. Um, if the patient had emergent care, you would choose 
um, the reason on your M2310 for that emergent care. And this is collected at transfer and then also at discharge. On your M2300, um, emergent care at time of or since the previous OASIS assessment had patient utilized a hospital emergency room. Um, if they haven't, you answer no. Um, or if they had a direct hospital admission and they didn't go through the emergency room, you answer no. But if that patient used the emergency room, then you would just need to answer um, did they have um, a hospitalization or not, were they admitted to the hospital. On your M2310, your reason for emergent care, you're going to mark all that apply. And you report the reason the patient sought care at the emergency room. Even if later on it proven, proves to be negative, um, if they had chest pain um, and they went to the emergency room, but then they were sent home because there were no signs of a heart attack, um, then you would still um, mark the chest pain as the reason for the patient um, seeking care. On discharge, on your M2400, you want to include yes on any of these rows, A through F, um, if that particular task was included in that patient's plan of care and there was evidence of implementation. So if we have a patient that um, is a diabetic and we marked yes to include um, diabetic foot care interventions on the um, plan of care and we actually included it in the plan of care and there's evidence that the nurses were assessing the lower extremities on all of their visits and there's evidence of some teaching related to diabetic foot care then you would be able to answer yes here so basically what they're looking for on these discharge oases is if we included the things that we needed to include in the plan of care and then also did we implement um, any of these particular interventions um, that we said we needed to as we included in the plan of care. Um, on M2420, on your discharge disposition, where is the patient after discharge from your agency and you choose only one answer? Um, patient remained in a community without formal assistive services, patient remained in a community with formal assistive services, patient transferred to a non-institutional hospice, or unknown because patient moved to a geographic location not served by the agency. Informed services are those that are provided, excuse me, informal services are provided by family, friends, neighbors, or other individuals without any type of financial compensation. Formal assistive services include but are not limited to programs like Meals on Wheels or the Patient Lives in the Assistant Living Facility, um, the Medicaid provider programs, and then paid assistance provided by an individual. So if the family themselves are paying someone to come in so many hours per week or so many hours per day to take care of that patient, then that uh, would be considered a formal assistive service. On your MOVE 903, that is the date of the last or most recent home visit, that includes the discharge visit if it's performed. So if you're in the home performing the discharge visit, then you would include your visit here. If the um, discharge is a, char a discharge from the chart, um, because either the patient wasn't available for the discharge visit or they declined the discharge visit, then we want to make sure um, that we are including the last home visit by any discipline that had been in the home. And then your MOVE 906, which is your discharge transfer or death date, you enter the actual date of discharge or the date of actual death or the date of the actual transfer to an inpatient facility. And remember, that's the admission date and not um, necessarily the date that they went to the emergency room. Okay, now on your assessment in Kinzer, when you pull up your OASIS, um, you're going to have um, different categories that come up, and those are your assessment sections. You want to make sure 
that in those assessment sections, you're hitting um, not only the OASIS questions themselves, but also um, the assessment parts of each one of those categories. As you look at the picture of an example, um, this was pulled from the endocrine section. Um, you want to make sure you complete the assessment under each one of the categories. And then in your comments, you want to give details of that assessment or any additional information that needs to be known about that particular patient. Your interventions and your goals, um, you'll see here, um, for example, under additional orders, you see that drop down box. We have gone in and entered in several um, diagnosis in order for you to choose from to be able to um, have as a part of your plan of care or your 485. Um, you want to avoid the check boxes in the Kinzer system if at all possible and use your drop down to include um, the diagnosis that we have chosen and then once you choose those interventions go in and edit that to make it patient specific because in home health your care plans or your 485s should always be patient specific you shouldn't be able to take one name off of one and just put it on the other because they all say the exact same thing so even though we've placed templates to give you a little bit easier time um, of not trying to remember um, related to each diagnosis, what should be done for that patient. Um, we tried to make it as easy as we possibly could, but at the same time, we do need you to edit them and make them specific to that patient and paint a, a picture of what that patient's um, needs are and what we need to be doing in the home. You'll see in this picture, when you click on the drop down box, um, actually some of the diagnosis as they come up, so you would just choose the diagnosis, for example, if I wanted CHF, I would just scroll down to CHF and it will automatically pop up the information under the additional order section that need to go on the 485 for that particular patient um, related to CHF. And again, like I said, make sure that you are editing that information. Your orders for disciplines, um, you're putting in your disciplines. Um, your frequency for your skilled nurse, your frequency for your home health aid, for your PT, OT, ST, and MSW, you want to say to eval week of, and then you should use Sunday as um, your week of. That gives that therapy discipline the opportunity to get in at any time during that week to evaluate that patient and then be able to set up their plan of care. Under your additional orders, you want to make sure that you are clicking on the um, admission or research um, narrative here. And we put that information in directly for you, but then you have to go in and edit that information. So you, again, you go to your drop down, you choose your admission slash resumption of care slash research um, task and then um, once you do that it drops down all of that information under your additional orders go in and edit that information and be really careful there because you want to make sure that especially under your skilled nurse for observation and assessment and teaching and training and management of evaluation and blah 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 um, we listed all of the things that Medicare considers to be qualifiers um, and so you have to go in and edit that information on the reason why we're in the home. So if the patient doesn't have an ostomy or a wound or catheter care, then make sure you're taking that information out because we just put everything in to give you um, the opportunity to not have to um, take so much time to sit back and think about what you need to put in. So just make sure you're editing that. Down at the very bottom of your OASIS, when you get on your starter cares, your resumption of cares, and your research, and you get down to your skilled intervention section, um, or your assessment instruction slash performance, here um, you want to make sure, again, that you are choosing um, the task of um, 
um, either admission or resumption of care or research. And we've given you just some additional information that you need to make sure that you are including on each of those OASIS. But in addition to what we've put there, you have to make sure that you are documenting um, why that patient is on services with us. Um, what are the services um, that they need? What skill did you perform during your visit? And then making sure that you instructed that patient on emergency preparedness, the emergency care plan, and our on-call protocol. Um, it's very important um, in the home health industry to make sure that you are performing a skill every single time you go into a patient's home. So just going into a patient's home and performing an assessment does not make that particular visit a billable visit. So we have to make sure that there is a skilled task that is performed. So for example, teaching is a skilled task. But I want you to be really careful um, about your documentation of your teaching. You, there's three words that you want to make sure that you use, either teaching, instructed, or taught. Um, advising or discussing something with a patient is not a skill. Um, it is felt that if you are advising or discussing that anybody could do that. Um, a, it takes a skilled person to instruct, to teach, or um, educate um, a patient or a caregiver. So make sure you're really careful about those words that you use. Um, and then you need to paint a picture of why does that patient need us in there? What are we there for? If that patient is a newly diagnosed diabetic that needs to learn how to use um, their glucometer, how to draw up the insulin, how to administer their insulin, um, how to um, follow their diet, just all the different things, the foot care and teaching who, a caregiver how to perform these different things. Whatever the need is for us to be in that home is what needs to be documented in this section. And then again, whatever skill that you performed, um, that is a billable skill. Um, the narrative, the admission narrative, um, or your resumption of care research narrative are super important. We have to make sure that there's certain things that we go over each time that we um, perform different OASIS. So that information, you need to make sure that you include along with all of your documentation um, under the skilled intervention section. And then we also put in the wound care perform just so you can just kind of fill that in um, and not have to worry about typing so much information. So again, you just go in um, and edit. <clears throat> your progress to goals, um, your conference with um, notifying the physician if you had to, if there were any order changes and then discharge planning. All of this section needs to be um, addressed um, as appropriate to your particular visit. So conference with any time that you perform an OASIS, you should have um, information of who you conference with. Even if you didn't necessarily have to contact the physician, but you should conference with any other disciplines that have been in that home, especially when you're recertifying that patient, because you should have some type of contact with the other disciplines that are in that home to determine what needs to be done for that patient um, in that upcoming CERT period. So if there's nothing but nursing in the home and there's an LVN in the home, then you should conference with that LVN sometime during your research before you complete your OASIS. If there's a home health aid, if there's physical therapy, um, there should always be documentation of who you conference with for that research um, visit because there should be some communication or coordination of care between the disciplines. Um, on your LVN supervision, this will come up on your research. We do supervise the LVNs for um, once a cert period. If you work for our South agency and you recertify a patient um, because of our ACHC accreditation, an LVN has to be supervised every 30 days under that ACH. ACHC accreditation, but for the majority of our patients, uh, which are in our South, in our East agency, um, the LVN is supervised once a cert period, 
and we do that at research so you want to make sure that you choose that drop down box and you choose that LVN's name and then you go down and you say you know if it's set if there's performance of taking care of that patient has been excellent satisfactory unsatisfactory and if anything is unsatisfactory or if there was some type of problem you want to make sure that you are reporting that to your director of nursing now if there was more than one LVN um, then we will have to make sure that the office schedules um, additional LVN supervisions to you because each LVN that has been in that home does have to be supervised. Make sure that if you notice more than one LVN has been in the home and the office has not scheduled any additional LVN supervisions to you that you do get that information to the office so we do stay in compliance. Same thing with your home health aid. Now your home health aid should be supervised throughout the entire CERT period within every 14 days. But on your research, they do have a section for your aid. Um, same thing, um, you are asking those questions that are listed. If anything um, is unsatisfactory, if there's any complaints, you want to make sure you are reporting that to your director of nursing. And again, um, if there's been more than one home health aid in the home um, since you supervised the aid, uh, the 14 days prior, then you will need additional aid supervisions assigned to you to make sure each aid has been supervised. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, before you sign your OASIS and submit it to the office for review, there's two things that you have to do go up to the toolbar when you're in your table of contents that shows all of your OASIS categories. Go up to your toolbar, click on tools, you'll see OASIS check and PPS plus analysis. Click on the OASIS check, it will go through, you'll see on the next screen, um, it will go through, it will check your OASIS and then you will have information that will pop up as to whether or not you need to make corrections to your OASIS. So if you left any of your OASIS questions blank, it will pop up here. Um, if you, in your diagnosis, you have a V code and you put a severity or a symptom control um, rating for a V code, it will pop up here to tell you to correct that. So any corrections that pop up, you want to make sure you go through and correct. Now, in the example here that I have um, showed you a screenshot of, it's a warning because it's just a risk assessment. So you'll see the yellow um, triangle with the exclamation mark. That's a warning. That's just basically um, saying, hey, 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 look at this. It may be something you need to correct. But if you get the red sign with the X, that is an error that needs to be fixed. So that's usually a reason why an OASIS would be rejected. So you want to make sure that if you get that red circle um, with the X that you do go through and actually make those corrections. And again, like I said, the yellow with the exclamation mark is just saying, hey, this might be an error, so you need to check it. Then you want to go back to your tools at the top and click on your PPS plus analysis. And then you'll see the following screen gives you um, a screenshot of what the PPS analysis looks like. And it just goes into more detail about the OASIS than the OASIS check does. Um, I really want everyone to make sure that you are utilizing this tool because this is something that we have to pay an additional fee to Kinzer in order to use. And it would prevent us from making so many mistakes um, in the office um, sending your OASIS back and forth and back and forth and back and forth several times. So make sure that you go through and you do the OASIS check and the PPS analysis on every single OASIS and it will avoid a lot of the problems that we're having um, with the um, OASIS going back and forth between the office and the field. Again, your errors legend, same thing, whether it's um, a warning um, with the yellow, if you get the red circle, it's something you need to definitely make sure that you do go in and correct. Um, and then, um, for example, the dollar sign. Like if you see um, here, 
It says the patient has a heart disease and COPD due to dyspnea. The patient may need additional assistance for the following area. So it's saying, hey, there's money sitting out there that is a potential to increase your HHRG score, which would give more reimbursement to the agency. Go back and review this. And it may not necessarily be something that you change because I want to tell you now, do not upcode. Do not go in and answer questions in order for the agency to make more money. Um, your answers have to be accurate and according to that patient's um, assessment, you cannot go through and just increase things um, just so the reimbursement can be higher. Now, we want you to be accurate in the sense of if we're taking care of a higher risk patient um, and we'll need the higher or the, the higher reimbursement to take care of that patient, then we most definitely want you to be accurate um, on that end but don't increase your scores just for the money. So um, questions like this are just to give you a heads up that because of this, you may be able to get a higher reimbursement. So go back and just review it or research it. So again, make sure that you are utilizing the OASIS check and the PPS analysis before you submit any OASIS to the office. And the last thing is the support. Um, again, like we talked about in the very beginning, your chapter three of your OASIS C1 guidance manual is so important for you to be able to look back at at any time. It's not necessarily something you want to print and carry around with you because it is um, very thick, um, hundreds of pages. Um, in order to print out and put in an actual notebook. But since you use a laptop or a tablet or your iPhone and these different electronic devices that we have, just go to the CMS website, pull up that Chapter 3 Oasis C1 Guidance Manual, and just tag it as a favorite or, like I said before, bookmark it, which I've done. I've made it a favorite on my laptop and then even on my desktop so I can just click on that button and it takes me right to it because I even... Um, hit that guidance manual quite a bit to make sure um, as people ask me questions I am answering them correctly. Um, again let me also point out to make sure to go to the WOCN guideline um, website for your um, guidelines for your wounds to make sure that you're answering those wounds correctly and then they also have really good pictures um, on the WOCN website for your pressure ulcers when you're trying to stage those to help you with that so you want to tag that also. And then um, your corporate um, educator and trainer, LaTanya Williams, myself, um, you can contact me at any time at lwilliams at homecarenetwork.com with any questions. I do travel between the, off the three offices, um, but if you call the main number, they will transfer you to whatever office I happen to be in at that time. And this concludes um, our um, training on the OASIS. If you, again, have any questions, please contact me at any time. And